Welcome everyone to our January clean water webinar. Um, this month we are doing a salt watch update. So first I'm going to talk about winter salt watch and then we have our guest here, Dr. Joel Moore from Towson University. He's a professor of geochemistry and hydrology and he studies how the urban environment impacts water quality. Um, so the way this is going to work, if you've come to our webinars before, you should be pretty familiar. Um, our speakers are going to speak, so I'm going to speak first for about 15, 20 minutes. Then Joel here is going to speak for 20, 25 minutes. And then we have around 15 minutes for question and answer time. So you should see um, that there's a question box to the right and you can type your questions in there. Um, we have a staff member, Zach, who's gonna answer some of those questions for you. Um, and um, then during the Q&A session, Joel and I will be able to answer your questions. I hope that sounds good. And if you have any trouble you can, you know, hearing us, seeing something, you can also type that in the question box because Zach will be monitoring it so he can tell us if something's going wrong. So um, <clears throat> I will tell you guys about how Salt Watch has been going so far this year. So if you're unfamiliar with Winter Salt Watch, we started about three and a half years ago, four years ago, almost exactly, um, because there was a big pile of salt outside of our office and our clean water fellow wanted to do something about it. And it was going right, sitting right on top of a storm drain um, in the muddy, in muddy Branch, which is in Maryland, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And we were finding really high chloride levels. And we figured if this is happening on this random street in our community, it has to be happening all over where salt is applied in the US. So what is our goal of Winter Salt Watch? Um, we want to raise awareness in the general public about the connection between salt and stream health. We want to identify chloride hotspots in fresh water. And um, this year, we're working more for advocating for smarter application of road salt by sharing results with private landowners and local state agencies and getting you guys to talk to people in your community about changing how salt is applied. So if you're here, it's very likely you've gotten a salt watch kit, so you should recognize these things. But what comes in a kit are four chloride test strips that test chloride in parts per million um, and instructions on how to take your sample and then a chart that helps you read your particular um, strips that we sent you. You might say, why can't you just read the strip on its own? The strip matches the conversion chart that we've sent you. So you need that chart to read the strips that come with it. Just in case you've gotten a few kits, but that's a tidbit for you. So when should volunteers monitor? You guys have been pretty good about this. Before any winter storms, we got a ton of baseline readings this year. So thank you so much. Um, and then now we are in the throes of winter. So after salt has been applied to roads before a storm, and then after there's any sort of warm day or rainstorm or melt following a snow, and then after another rain event. So I think a good number of you have used two or three strips. Um, it's good to use another strip in the spring. And if you run out of strips because you've used them all and you've shared all your results, that's okay. You can contact us and we can send you another kit. So this is how you participate. You take your sample and then you follow these instructions to share your results. You take a picture and you share it on the Water Reporter app. If you have ordered a kit, this should look very familiar. Um, and if you have any questions, if you've had trouble using Water Reporter, again, you can email us, let us know, we'll help you troubleshoot. And this is an ideal salt watch report on Water Reporter. 
you put in some information about your monitoring event. This is a great picture. We can see the strip, we can see the chart, so we can easily read it and it's in the right location so we can tell where you took it. And this is just a collage of all of the great, great reports we've got this year. So what can you do besides take a reading? You can take action. If you do find high levels of chloride, you should let someone know in your community. You should report those high readings to your local watershed group, to your local government. And if you do see high chloride levels or large salt piles, you should be able to call your city or county Department of Environmental Protection to report them and to try to get them to clean, the, clean it up. You won't necessarily get action from that, but making that call means it can become a priority if enough people in the community call about it. You can write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper. We have a sample letter that you can start with and adapt for your use. And then we also have road salt best practices on our website that you can share with the folks in your community who manage the salt application. So I just want to share some results with you. Um, so this is from last year. Um, we had we sent out over a thousand kits and we got um, almost 800, 770 reports back. Um, and this is a summary, so you can't see some of those really high levels, but we saw really high levels in Minnesota and then some intermittently high levels in Michigan and DC and Philadelphia. And then this year we've sent out, salt watch has exploded. We've sent out twice as many kits, 2,200 and counting, um, because we sent out, sent out about 100 a week, it feels like and approximately 850 reports. Again, that's and counting. It's only January. We run this till May typically, and some people give us results over the summer. And you can see from the map, we've expanded a little bit. We have a lot more, um, a, a lot of participation in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and um, the sort of orange you see over Philly and DC, that is from the one, snow event we had in December, I believe. So there are some initiatives beyond Salt Watch that we're associated with, um, but I'm gonna tell you about them specifically in these next um, highlights of regions. So we have a lot of participants in the DMV area. Like I said, there was one big winter storm event and we saw spikes afterwards. There were also several spots in the DMV when people were taking their baselines that were over 100 parts per million, which indicate that there is chloride that has gotten to the groundwater and you know that gets into streams. So it's not just from this year's salt application, it's from previous years as well. And this is our map from this year. Um, we've had a lot of great results um, in DC, in Maryland, DC and Virginia. You can see all of that green, all that green is good, um, but the red and orange is where it gets a little dicier. And then in the Philadelphia area, we have had such great support for the last three years, sustained monitoring from the help of all of the local watershed groups associated with the Delaware River Watershed Initiative and their Upper Philly cluster. And they've also, gotten really great media coverage for Salt Watch. So that's excellent for us and for them so that salt remains an issue in water quality at the top of folks' minds in Philly area. And they saw that same storm as we did in the DC area. And predictably there were spikes in chloride following that melting the snow. Um, these are really clustered, clustered monitoring efforts in Philadelphia. Um, but you can see the dark, dark red means that those are high, possibly toxic levels of chloride. And then this year with Minnesota, we started an initiative. We have a little bit of funding from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to get chloride data from the salt watch kits in order to identify hotspots of chloride. Um, specifically outside of the Twin Cities because they have pretty good monitoring there. 
Um, but two watershed districts in the Twin Cities metro area, Coon Creek and Nine Mile Creek, they make and distribute their own salt watch kits, which is great. And basically since December in the Twin Cities, we regularly see, strip, regularly see strips that are completely white, which means that they're over 600 parts per million, which is a pretty hazardous level of chloride to see in the water. So you can see we have a cluster of monitoring around the Twin Cities. It's good, the levels outside of the Twin, Twin Cities are pretty low, um, but around the Twin Cities, a lot of strips end up looking like this. And then in Wisconsin, this is basically our first year having um, any sort of significant role, results in Wisconsin. We've been working with Wisconsin SaltWise. They had Wisconsin Salt Awareness Week last week. If you missed it, I think you can still catch their um, presentations on their website, which is wisaltwise.com. Um, but we worked with them to develop handouts that you can find on our website um, to neighbors and local property owners about smarter salt use. We've gotten a lot of requests in Wisconsin from city and county and township staff um, compared to other states. It's really people who work for their local government want to take um, chloride readings. And in Wisconsin, there's a lot of interest in monitoring around lakes. You can see not a ton of high levels, but a couple of um, red dots smattering the area. And then what can you do in your community still? Well, it's only January, so you can keep monitoring and sharing your results. You should use up your whole kit. There are four strips in there. Use up your whole kit and share your results with us. If you have trouble sharing your results, let us know. Um, if you can't figure out the whole water reporter thing, you can just email us the results and tell me where you took, where, where and when you took it and with a picture. Um, you can tell neighbors and local businesses about smarter salt use. Um, one thing we're trying to promote lately is that you shouldn't be fooled by eco or pet friendly packaging on um, de-icers because that could just be other chlorides. Sometimes if something isn't sodium chloride, it will just, you know, they'll label magnesium or potassium chloride as eco or pet friendly because it's not standard table salt, but it is still a chloride and still puts chloride into the water. And like we mentioned before, you should report over salting to your city or county. And this link at the bottom um, is just to our what you can do page. And there are gonna be some updates really this week. I know I've promised that before, but tomorrow they should change. So this is what our what you can do page looks like. Um, we have resources on there about background information. And then we have these flyers to share with folks. And then we have um, a template letter for your state legislator and tomorrow we're going to be posting state specific letters if there's a different situation in your state for example in minnesota there's already a program for training and certifying um, salt applicators but that's not true in pennsylvania so we we advocate for different things in those places and you can use and edit those letters to your heart's desire like i said with more to come this week so that's all i have for now um keep reporting keep monitoring and keep salt watching and i am going i'm not going to take questions right now joel and i will take the questions after let me switch to give Joel the presentation. There we go. And if you weren't here when I started, this is Joel Moore. He's a professor from Towson University studying geochemistry and hydrology, and he has done a ton of work on chloride and water around the country. Are you seeing my screen? Maybe not. I just see white. Yeah, okay, sorry, one second. 
Um, so it keeps, do you see it? It worked before, so I'm not. I no. swear it worked before everybody. <laughs> we practiced this. Here yeah. we go. I just, I see your calendar. Now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Emily. Now I'm going to turn off my video while I talk. Um, but thanks for to everyone for joining. And it's really exciting to see all the work that Isaac Walton League and all volunteers are doing. You know, any sort of change on this is only going to happen through the sort of efforts that all of you are engaged in. Um, some of the work that scientists do, of course, is important to to documenting what's going on, but of course, through sort of citizen action and that sort of thing is the only way we'll make changes. So I'm going to talk today about chloride and conductivity as an emerging contaminant of concern in streams, lakes, and groundwater. And most of what I'll talk about will be streams, um, but I'll touch a little bit on lakes and groundwater. On my title slide here is a picture of a stream here in the Baltimore region, a stream that my students and I have been sampling regularly for a number of years now um, in icy conditions. And you can see the conductivity is about 1,400 microsiemens per centimeter. Um, so that would correspond to something in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 milligrams per liter of chloride. So first, I'd like to thank the people who funded some of the work I'll be talking about today, the US Geological Survey through the Maryland Water Resources Research Center, National Science Foundation, a number of colleagues, particularly at the USGS, Rosemary Finelli and Andrew Sakelik. And I'll be talking br briefly later about a couple ongoing projects I have with Rosemary and others. Okay, so taking a page from uh, one of the previous presenters, I'm going to do some definitions up front to make sure we're on the same page. So when I'm talking about de-icing salts, I'm primarily talking about sodium chloride. That's certainly by far the most common. As Emily just mentioned, there are other chlorides like calcium chloride and magnesium chloride, which are sometimes labeled eco or pet friendly. Um, in terms of the streams themselves, as Emily also mentioned, the calcium and chloride and magnesium chloride are seem to be just as bad or worse in some ways because there's twice as much chloride as sodium chloride. Um, certainly the calcium and magnesium chloride are easier on plants and terrestrial systems, which is one of the reasons people use them. Um, I'll be talking throughout this presentation about conductivity and specific conductance and connecting it to chloride. And the systems we've been looking at, those are highly correlated between conductivity and chloride. And specific conductance is just one particular basically unit for conductivity. Conductivity varies both with the amount of ions like sodium and chloride that are dissolved in water and it varies with temperature. And so specific conductance um, is a correction to normalize it to 25 degrees Celsius or about room temperature. And so that way you can compare the conductivity in terms of specific conductance say between winter and summer. And then I'll talk a few times about hard water. Um, hard water is well buffered. It has high calcium and alkalinity. Um, alkalinity is acid neutralizing capacity versus soft water, which is much lower concentration of ions, including being less well buffered. And hard water is typically associated with limestone or other carbonate rocks. So certainly in the Midwest, there's a lot of hard water and I'll touch on that a few times. And in selected locations in the Eastern US, there's hard water as well. So the overall outline for my talk, why do we care about chloride, um, how we've used salt in the US for de-icing, some multi-decade trends in chloride across the US, connections between conductivity and chloride, and then wrap up with some gaps, some positives, and some conclusions. So there are two big reasons that we care about chloride, aquatic life, the health of streams, and drinking water quality. So I'm gonna show you some data for mayfly abundance in relation to conductivity, and that conductivity in the experiments was controlled by sodium and chloride concentrations. And so notice that the y-axis on this plot is a logarithmic scale, so it goes in units of 10 rather than units of one. So there's a four order of magnitude change across the y-axis in the plot where I'm showing the data here. 
So what you can see is that as conductivity increases from zero to about 4,500 microsiemens per centimeter, the amount of mayflies drops by about an order of magnitude from 100 down to 10. And these mayflies were taken out of a stream that had naturally low conductivity. The conductivity of the stream is where that arrow is, or about 200 or 300 microsiemens per centimeter. By contrast, mayflies that came out of a stream that had much higher natural conductivity, about 1,200 microsiemens per centimeter, they barely declined as conductivity increased from close to zero up to about 4,500 microsiemens per centimeter. So chloride and conductivity can have a big effect on aquatic life in, organ in a stream, um, but the sort of natural pre-existing conditions make a big difference as to the effect of the chloride. As mentioned, drinking water quality is a second reason we care about chloride. Um, here's a plot from a study by U.S. Geological Survey co-authors, and it shows a metric of the corrosivity of water on the y-axis and then the percent of urban development on a log scale on the x-axis. So two would be 100% urban development on the right side of the x-axis, um, and zero would be 1%. So ranges from zero, close to zero, up to 100% urban development, um, and then the corrosivity index in the y-axis. And so you can see that overall, the more urban a stream is or watershed is, the more corrosive the water becomes, and that's connected to the chloride concentrations in the water. Um, and you can see that the green line in 2010 to 2012, and green dots are higher than the tan dots, which are from 1992 to 1993. So in more urban and salted watersheds, the water becomes more corrosive. This is not just streams. We see this in groundwater as well. There are a number of places here in Maryland and I, no doubt in other states where high chloride in wells coming from road salt has caused a lot of damage, water heater failures and uh, metal piping failures due to the increased corrosivity. And the corrosivity related to chloride was a contributing factor of several in the Flint, Michigan issue of several years ago. So one of my favorite quotes about the impact of chloride is from Dr. Meg Duffy, who's at University of Michigan and studies aquatic organisms in lakes. And she wrote several years ago now that she wondered if road salt would be the major freshwater pollutant of our generation, like phosphorus was for an earlier generation. So I think about this a lot and it motivates a lot of my work. So road salt, how has our use of road salt changed? So we started using road salt in the U.S. back in the late 30s, early 40s. Up through about 1960, we used less road salt than was coming down out of the atmosphere and precipitation. After about 1960, 62, we started using more road salt, applying more to roads than was being deposited in precipitation. Um, reached a plateau from the 1970s until the early 1990s, and then took a big jump in the early 1990s. Uh, what I find ironic about that is that spent a lot of time and money in the late 80s, early 90s studying alternatives to sodium chloride, um, and then the big transportation bill passed, and we started using even more sodium chloride. So I haven't figured out the, all the reasons for that, but it's an uh, it's interesting story. And then we continue to use more to present, and a lot of it is driven by, and certainly there are safety concerns, there are good reasons that we use de-icing salts. Um, but there are also political and citizen pressures for our increased use of the road salt and de-icing salts. Um, how quickly we expect roads to be clear after a storm, et cetera, are part of the driver as well. And I've talked to people in some regions where they've just started using a lot more salt in the last 10 years, not because there's more snow, but in response to political pressures. And I would like to make a note, it's not entirely de-icing salt that's driving chloride in streams. Depending on the region, there can be other substantial contributors. So this is a study that just came out in the last few weeks um, for the state of Minnesota, where they looked at road salt use, which is certainly the biggest contributor, where they use 400,000 tons a year in Minnesota, and they use about 200,000, a little more than 200,000 a year for each of fertilizer, and that comes out of wastewater treatment plants. And the reason it's coming out of wastewater treatment plants is that we're softening our water. We're putting sodium and chloride into the water to reduce the hardness, which can 
cause problems for pipes, cookware, et cetera. And so in some regions, particularly the Midwest, um, the fertilizer and wastewater con contributions may be substantial in some watersheds. The wastewater treatment is somewhat easier to get a handle on because those are discrete sources. They discharge out of a pipe, whereas road salt's being spread all over the landscape. Okay, so that's how we're using salt in some of the trends. Now I'm gonna talk about what we're seeing in our streams and also lakes and groundwater in the US. So as I mentioned, talking about hard water and soft water, um, that varies depending on the bedrock geology. So this is a study from John Olson where it looked at conductivity in streams across the United States. And here I'm showing just the Eastern United States. So the points that are blue are less than one to two, uh, 100 to 200 microsiemens per centimeter or 0.1 to 0.2 millisiemens. So you can see most of the Eastern US um, east of the Appalachian Mountains is less than one to 200 microsiemens per centimeter. Um, once you get out into Ohio, into parts of the Midwest, it starts to go up, and that's again connected to bedrock and soils as well as to climate. So that's what you would predict based on the bedrock soils and climate. What we actually observe are rather higher concentrations, both in the Midwest, where you can see all those red points across Ohio, Indiana, and, high, and Illinois, and then you can certainly see along the eastern seaboard from DC up to Boston and up into upstate New York, um, lots of points that are much, much higher than we would expect based on um, background conditions. So that's sort of a snapshot in time. Now we're gonna look at how concentrations of chloride have changed at a few watersheds in the Baltimore area. So the Baltimore area has been host to the Baltimore Ecosystem Study where they've been sampling streams weekly since the late 90s. And so we're gonna look at four watersheds that have similar bedrock geology. There are no point sources like wastewater treatment plants and land use has been relatively stable. And so what we're gonna look at is chloride concentrations along the y-axis here and then time from the late 90s up to 2014 along the x-axis. Um, and what you can see is the green line way down at the bottom is a completely forested and scrubland um, watershed. And so chloride concentrations are, you know, two to four milligrams per liter, quite, quite low. Um, and then an uh, agricultural watershed nearby, they're a little bit higher, but not much higher. Then we look at a watershed that has 1% impervious cover. So it's 70% forest and then some really low density uh, suburban land and you jump up to 20 to 40 milligrams per liter of chloride. So it was 20 milligrams per liter in around 2000 and it increased or basically doubled up to 40 milligrams per liter at, in 2014. So even in an area with some major roads, a few major roads and low density urban, we're getting substantial elevation um, higher than the background and increasing concentrations with time. And we look at watersheds that have around 20% impervious surface cover. So impervious surfaces are parking lots, roads, houses, et cetera. You can see that those watersheds have even higher chloride and the chloride concentrations are increasing substantially over time in those watersheds as well. And so this is a really dense data set. Again, samples were collected weekly over um, a couple of decades. And so we see this sort of trend with time and I'll show you next how we see similar trends across the United States. Um, and one thing to point out is in that suburban and forested watershed in the light green, we estimated that only about 50 to 60% of the chloride that was being applied as de-icing salt each year was being exported from the watershed um, in that year. And so as Emily mentioned, you have chloride and salts that are going into groundwater and those can take years or even decades to move to streams. And then you have some that can get into the streams within days to weeks. And so you have both quick and slow movements of chloride into streams. So that was the Baltimore area. Now we'll zoom out and look at increasing chloride concentrations across the US. And so this is a really nice study done by US Geological Survey authors where they looked at a bunch of streams, particularly in the upper Midwest, a few on the East Coast and a couple of sort of comparison watersheds in Texas and Oregon where they use little to no de-icing salt. Um, and what they found 
is they compared the early 90s, 1990 to 94, in the yellow orange color, and what the concentrations were in streams in 2006, 2010, and blue. So here we have chloride concentration on the y-axis again, and the percent of urban land cover on the x-axis. So the right are more urban watersheds, the left are less urban. And you can see both in the early 90s and the late 2000s that the more urban the watershed is, the higher the chloride concentration is. Um, and the slope or the concentrations are higher in the late 2000s than they were in the early 90s. Um, so these were model, a combination of modeled and measured data. Um, the measured data was collected a few to several times per year. Um, then they took that data and figured out how many days a year are chloride concentrations higher than 230 milligrams per liter. That 230 milligrams per liter is the EPA criteria for the protection of aquatic life in streams, things like benthic macroinvertebrates and fish. You can see again, the more urban a watershed is, the more days a year it spends above that threshold. Um, and it spends more days in the late 2000s than it did in early 1990s. One of the most valuable parts of this study is they looked at the amount of road salt used or sold in the US and they compared it to how many more roads um, were put in between the early 90s or late 80s and the late 2000s. And so that brown maroon line shows the growth of developed land cover. Um, and you can see that increases by about 70% from 1986 to 2010. And you can see that the amount of road sales increased by even more than that. Um, and so about 40% of the increased use in road salt is a change in practice how we're applying salt, not just because we have more roads. Um, real quickly, we're seeing similar increases in chloride in lakes. This is a really nice study by Hilary Dugan at University of Wisconsin-Madison and colleagues were looked at hundreds of lakes across the United States. Um, and the key thing is in the plots on the right, you can see that most of those lines are going up. So chloride concentrations in lakes are increasing with time um, and that any lake where there's more than 1% impervious surface cover, they were seeing increasing chloride concentration. So they looked at how many lakes there are across North America in the US and Canada and estimated that almost 8,000 lakes are at risk for elevated chloride concentrations. U.S. Geological Survey did a study comparing the 90s to the 2000s for groundwater across the United States, and here a focus on the Midwest and the Northeast, and you can see lots of big red arrows pointing up, um, showing increases in chloride concentrations in groundwater from the 90s to the 2000s. Um, as I mentioned, increased chloride in groundwater can affect those with wells um, because it makes the water more corrosive, particularly in soft water regions. Um, this is from a study from Kelsey Piper and others at Virginia Tech where they looked at wells in northern New York and found that the chloride concentration in groundwater increased. Um, it was lowest near minor roads, was a little bit higher near major roads, and then was up above 200 parts per million or milligram per liter down gradient of a salt barn. And the picture below shows some of the piping um, and the impact to drinking water infrastructure as a result of chloride-driven corrosivity. So those are some multi-decade trends. Um, now I'm gonna talk about a recent study I did with the USGS colleague where we used high-frequency data to look at chloride. So a lot of the studies I talked about previously, they measured um, you know, a few times a year, or there was the one where we measured every week, but some of the action in chloride can happen on the hourly to daily timescale. And so what we did was we looked at conductivity data or specific conductance data from 93 sites across the Eastern US. And as I mentioned, there's a really good correlation between conductivity and chloride in many watersheds. So conductivity or specific conductance is shown here on the x-axis. Chloride concentrations are shown on the y-axis. And you can see the orange in the orange oval, there's an R squared or there's a correlation of very close to one between conductivity and chloride. And so we took these data and converted the conductivity data that the US Geological Survey was collecting at these sites every two to 15 minutes over many years to convert the conductivity data into chloride data. And we've, in addition to making these relationships for particular sites, like the one on the left, we've done them for regions as well, for the Mid-Atlantic, 
New England, and the southeastern U.S. So to give you a sense of why high-frequency data are important, particularly related to de-icing salts, here's a watershed from northern Virginia with only 1% impervious surface cover. Chloride concentration is 10 to 20 milligrams per liter. The blue line shows the chloride data as determined from high-frequency data collected every 15 minutes in this case, and the orange dots show grab samples. So someone went, scooped water out of the stream, then they measured chloride concentrations. And here you can see that if you were using those grab samples that someone scooped out of the stream, you could do a nice job of understanding what chloride concentrations were in the stream. By contrast, looking at a watershed with 13% impervious surface cover, um, the blue line showing the high frequency data uh, demonstrates that you would miss a lot of the action of what was going on with chloride coming in from de-icing salts if you were only looking at the discrete or scooped out of the stream data, those orange points. And so by using the high frequency data collected every five minutes in this watershed, we were able to quantify and calculate how much of the year is the this particular stream in exceedance of the EPA chronic exposure limit, which is that 230 milligrams per liter I already mentioned, and of the acute exposure limit, which is 860 milligrams per liter. So the acute exposure limit is applicable over one hour. The chronic exposure limit is applicable over a four-day period. And so for these watersheds, um, particularly you know, the lower one um, that I just added, there are only three discrete samples during the period of high chloride. Um, and that particular watershed spent, I think, something like 10 or 15 days above the acute exposure limit and something like 40 or 50 days above the chronic exposure limit, but you'd have a really hard time determining that if you were only, or you, it'd be impossible to determine that if you only had the discrete scooped out of the stream data. So high frequency data can be really important, but we can connect this high frequency data to the discrete samples as I'll talk about in a minute. So we took that similar sort of data that I showed in the last slide and looked at it at 93 sites along the eastern seaboard with a number of sites in Georgia and one in North Carolina that we're calling the southeast in green, some sites in the mid-Atlantic. I'll focus on streams that have softer water um, underlain by silicate bedrock in blue, and then the red triangles up in New England. So we had nearly 30 million observations in our study. Um, and as a reminder, we'd expect the conductivity in these streams to be one to 200 microsiemens per centimeter um, in the absence of human anthropogenic disturbance. So here's what conductivity data look like across this region. So here are the green data from the southeast. Each of these points represents about 300,000 data that are consolidated into one point. So each point represents the median or the 50th percentile, and then the bars, which you can't see on the southeastern streams, represent the 25th and 75th percentile, so some of the variation in the data. So what you can see in the southeast is that streams do get slightly more conductive as you have more impervious surface cover or more urbanization in a watershed. You move to the mid-Atlantic and you see all the concentrations of conductivity, which again correlate to chloride, are higher, um, and that rate of increase with urbanization is much higher and the correlation is higher as well. Correlation moves from 0.4, which is a moderate to weak, correlation up to 0.7. And you can see more variability as well in the mid-Atlantic mid watersheds. Um, and one threshold for sensitive taxa like mayflies and streams um, for the mid-Atlantic and for the southeast have a similar sort of threshold you can see that basically all the streams in the southeast, or most of them, are below that threshold, but most of the streams in the mid-Atlantic are above that threshold once you get above about 10% impervious surface cover. Um, and then in New England, the conductivity of streams is even higher, is more variable, um, and there's a stronger, even stronger correlation. So there's clearly a strong connection between the use of de-icing salts, which we get more in detail in our paper, um, published manuscript, and elevated conductivity. And then here's the chloride data, which of course look just like the conductivity data. As I've mentioned a few times, there's a 
high correlation. So this is what the chloride data look like, basically the same trends as you see in the conductivity data. Um, and so what we find when we calculate how often those EPA criteria are exceeded is that we find in the southeast for chloride, those criteria are not exceeded in any of the watersheds. In the mid-Atlantic and in New England, those criteria are exceeded commonly. So in the mid-Atlantic, they're exceeded by 45 to 70 days a year. Um, they're not supposed to be exceeded more than once in a three-year period. So basically all the watersheds with more than 9% impervious surface cover have frequent exceedances each year. Um, and again, these represent three to 11 years of data. And so this isn't just a one-year thing, but something that represents you know, almost a decade of data. And then you can see in the New England streams, um, there are some small watersheds near Boston that spend almost the entire year above the EPA criteria. Um, what we find is that the exceedances of the EPA criteria for chronic exceedances um, are highly correlated with the median chloride in the stream. So what that means is you could go out in the middle of summer, measure the chloride concentration, at least in a soft water stream, and you, from based on our data, you could have a decent sense of predicting how many days a year you, you would, ex sorry, how many days a year you exceed the EPA chloride criteria. And what we found for New England, the mid-Atlantic, is that watersheds with more than 30 to 80 milligrams per liter chloride frequently exceeded the EPA criteria, which helps explain some of the ecological findings others have had in the past about organisms in urban streams. Of course, chloride is not the only story. There are a lot of contaminants going into urban streams, but it seems to me at least as a non-ecologist that chloride is a big part of the story. We see a similar pattern for the acute criteria, but I'll skip that today. And then to wrap up, what are some of our knowledge gaps and what are some of the positive things that we're seeing related to chloride in streams? Certainly a gap is that we need more spatial data, particularly for small streams. Um, and so I think that's one of the really valuable things that SaltWatch and all of you are contributing. Here's a map that's based on our study that I did with my USGS colleagues. Um, you can find that map at the URL below and you can look at all the watersheds and summary results for the 93 sites that we looked at. One thing you'll notice is that there aren't any data from Philadelphia. USGS has a bunch of data they're collecting now, but there were no data there from 2008 to 2018 during our data period that I cited in the study. Um, and so definitely lots of holes to fill in. Some USGS colleagues and I, Rosemary Finelli and others are working on putting together a compilation of conductivity data for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so we hope to have every stream reach up to you know one to two kilometers in length put into uh, a data set that will be released publicly within the next six, six to 12 months. Some of the data that's now being collected around Philadelphia is part of a big USGS initiative to understand what's happening in the Delaware River, Delaware River Basin, and I'm working with my USGS colleagues to understand certainly chloride dynamics there. And then I'm part of an urban critical zone cluster that was recently started in the fall with Laura Turan at Temple in Philadelphia, um, Claire Welty at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, people from Penn State, from Pitt, um, and USGS people, and we're going to look at sites from Philadelphia down to Raleigh, and certainly chloride and conductivity will be a big focus. So if you're interested in any of those, please feel free to contact me. Um, and certainly in the study I just talked about, we don't have much data on carbonate or hard water streams um, like you would commonly find in the Midwest and parts of the East Coast, and so that's a gap that needs to be filled in. Some positives is because people are becoming more and more aware of this being an issue, as Emily talked about, Minnesota, they're certainly aware. Um, I've been involved in efforts in Northern Virginia to start reducing application of road salt, and they certainly have been looking to Minnesota for an example. There are places like New Hampshire where they've taken some interesting regulatory steps to help train people on how to apply salt properly. And if you're in the mid-Atlantic and presumably other parts of the US, you've seen more and more of the brining where they spray the road rather than applying salt later. And that's a real positive 
um, brining reduces the use of sodium chloride by something like 40 to 50 percent in many cases. And there was a nice paper focused on St. Louis last year or two years ago now where they documented that well. Another potential solution, I grew up in western Massachusetts and the you know, back even in the 80s, they had low salt areas around the streams that drained to drinking water reservoirs to reduce and limit the amount of chloride going into drinking water. Um, so there's a, a lot of movement happening on this area in reducing the impacts of chloride. And I think the efforts of all of you will help speed that up even more. So some quick conclusions, elevated and increasing chloride concentrations have negative implications for aquatic life and drinking water quality. De-icing salt use has increased substantially over the last 60 years. Chloride and conductivity concentrations are increasing in streams like in groundwater across the northern U.S. And high frequency data show that urban areas or roads and de-icing salt are both necessary to get really high chloride concentrations, at least in the eastern U.S. Positive is we're seeing some changes in the right direction due to growing awareness. So thanks. And I'll take any of your questions. And I think Emily's can be on for questions as well. Yes, I am. Should I stop sharing? Yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen so folks can see the information. Okay, um, we have a ton of questions. Zach, would you mind asking us the questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've um, got, I don't know. Honestly, first off, um, thanks everyone but also this is recorded and um, at least if you want my presentation, I can send a copy and I don't know, Joel, are you willing to share your presentation too? Okay, yeah. so I have a copy of Joel's presentation. So if you just email um, this email address you see here, saltwatch at iwla.org, I can send out copies of these presentations if you're interested. Go ahead, Zach. Perfect, yeah, we've had a couple people asking um, about the presentations and the recording, so that's perfect. Um, yeah, we had several questions. I don't think I don't know if we'll have time to get to all of them, but um, Emily, somebody asked. Um, they said they have purchased they have strips that they purchased from Hawk, the company that makes the chloride test strips that we use. Mm -hmm. um, so I have the Saltwatch card that they received in the mail, and they were wondering if it's better to use their strips against the compared to the scale use on the, the, the use scale the with the bottle it came in all right um and then somebody's also asking if there's any sort of recommendation on how frequently uh, we should be monitoring in salt watch so with salt watch we leave it pretty open you know four strips is kind of to get your feet wet no pun intended uh, in monitoring so you know you can go out you know, before and after you expect a chloride spike. But if you want to do more regular monitoring, say once a week um, or before and after every rain event, you know, we can send more kits if you're going to use them. We also had and some. Also, I, I was just going to say one thing. We focus on the winter time, but um, Joel was talking about the chloride levels that you can find in the summer. So. If you want to do year round, um, you're welcome to do that. We just kind of go dormant as far as sending out kits, but we still accept the data. All right. Um, and I don't know if you've really had a chance to uh, go in and analyze the data yet from this year, but somebody asked if you're seeing big spikes at sites that have low baseline chloride. I guess maybe um, be able to. I I haven't had a chance to look at that yet, um, but definitely in some, like there are some cases I can think of, at least in the in the DC area where that's true, where the baseline was, you know, less than 30, which is our lowest level, and that they've spiked over 200 for from the last snowstorm. So that happens definitely. Um, so somebody had a great question about uh, taking action uh, locally, and I'll just read their question word for word. If, one, if someone's trying to reduce uh, salt distribution in a major city with a large streets department, in my case Philly, 
uh, whom is best to approach the streets department, city council person, the commissioner himself or herself are their most effective target individuals. I will say from talking to people um, who have fought this fight in other places, um, the answer is try a few places until someone responds or listens. Um, sometimes it is, you know, the Department of Transportation. Sometimes it is talking to someone on the city council. Um, it entirely depends on who's willing to talk to you and it could take um, some repeat tries. I will say um, there's a group in Edina, Minnesota and they're throughout the Twin Cities, which is called Stop Over Salting. And they've done a lot of really great local work um, and that they started with talking to some folks on the city council and they were able to make changes in how the salt was applied in their community. But I don't have a sort of cookie cutter answer as to far as far as who you can talk to. Otherwise, it would have much more detailed instructions, but there is no one clear answer. Um, this came in during Joel's presentation, uh, but I'm sure either of you could probably give an answer to it. Somebody's asking, what exactly does high conductivity do to macroinvertebrates, et cetera? So other aquatic life. So um, it changes sort of the osmotic pressure. Like we, they have to regulate salt coming in or out. Um, and by salt ions, I should say, coming in or out. And so high conductivity sort of screws with that osmotic regulation and can impose sort of an energy cost to them. They have to work a lot harder to regulate their um, uh, what ions are coming in and out. And particularly if they've adapted to a stream that is naturally low conductivity, they're set up a certain way and then they have to work even harder and that sort of energy cost seems to be a big source of stress to them. And in short, partly we're still trying to figure it out um, through some experimental and laboratory data, but that the emerging data, as I understand it as a non-biologist, is, is that largely that osmotic ion regulation cause. So think about if you, you know, run or exercise, right, you need to keep drinking water, but if you're doing a marathon, you need to drink Gatorade or something too to regulate your salt and organisms and streams need to do something similar. And if you start drinking salt water, that that's not good for you, right, for humans. And there are somewhat analogous effects for organisms and macroinvertebrates, the insects sort of at the base of the food chain seem to be among the most vulnerable. That's a great answer. Um, somebody also asked uh, during your presentation, Joel, I think it was in relation to the graphs you're showing of chloride concentrations increasing over time. Um, they're wondering if some of those increases might also be related to climate change and more severe storm events. Um, it, that depends somewhat regionally, but yeah, it's it's possible some of them are related to climate change um, and storm events. But actually, you know, a big winter storm event can actually mean less salt in streams. So a couple of years ago here in Maryland, we got about our average amount of snow, which is something like 20 inches, but we got basically all of it in one snow event. So they only salted a couple of times. Whereas if you got a bunch of small snowstorms across the winter, then they'd salt a bunch of times. And so it, it depends a lot on when the snow falls, how much of it falls. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of factors that go into it. Certainly climate change and more severe storms will be a factor over the longer term. But I think in terms of the salt story, it's not a big factor yet um, would be my yeah, off the cuff answer on that. Um, somebody asked, are there any, or are there many anthropogenic impacts on conductivity during the summer? So the summer is primarily groundwater inputs in the streams. And so what you're seeing is the salt, the chloride that was applied years or even decades ago. And so you see sort of a smeared out sort of not a sharp peak like you in the winter, but sort of the average 
of what's happened over a lot of years is groundwater slowly infiltrates through the subsurface and then um, discharges into the streams. And so certainly you do, do see some impact and you see chloride concentrations seem to be going up on the whole summer after summer, but you don't get the big acute pulses of salt like you do in the winter, at least in the mid-Atlantic. There is some evidence from some streams in New England um, that they actually get saltier in the winter, partly, uh, and I don't know the reason why, I haven't seen any good reason for that, but it's sort of the groundwater versus surface um, inputs into streams. And so the salt they apply in the winter, most of it seems to go into the subsurface and then pops up into the streams in the winter time. So that can vary from place to place as to whether the bigger impact is in the summer or in the winter. But those summer impacts tend to be sort of big, broad peaks, not a bunch of salt that just got sluiced right into the stream after a melting event or rainstorm that followed salting. What? I just want to say one question I did see a few times for you, Joel, was um, just about what hard water means and what that has to do with chloride. Yeah, so hard water is water that calcium and alkalinity has dissolved into. So think about marble, think about the rock that makes up the Washington Memorial or um, limestone Washington Monument. Um, so that is a relatively soluble rock. Um, and it dissolves quickly and puts a lot of calcium and alkalinity or acid buffering capacity into streams. So that's all over the Midwest. It's in places of the Northeast, like some of the valleys up in Pennsylvania or Shenandoah Valley. And so when you have a lot of that limestone and you have a lot of calcium and alkalinity, that means you have naturally high conductivity. And so the streams, so the organisms in those streams will be somewhat adapted to high conductivity. So if you add salt to those streams, it doesn't seem to impact the organisms quite as much because they're already adapted to high conductivity. And some of the laboratory studies seem to show that if you have more calcium around as compared to chloride, or even more if you have a mix of all ions rather than just sodium and chloride, there is some protective effect or less toxicity of chloride when you have a mix of different ions in the water. So those two things are the biggest way um, that hardness of water impacts or affects chloride. And then for drinking water, if you have hard water, um, it tends to be less corrosive. It has other issues, which is why people soften it, um, but it tends to be less corrosive. And so when you add chloride, it doesn't become nearly so corrosive as the soft water that we see in much of the Eastern US, certainly here in the mid-Atlantic, where again, people's water heaters will rust out in a year or two if they're getting high chloride coming into their wells from nearby roads. Thank you. We have a few more minutes for questions. Don't wanna to go too much over our time. Yeah, um, and I also posted this in the chat folks, but uh, if we don't get a chance to address your question and you would like um, a specific follow-up, you can email us at the email address Emily's got pulled up on the screen there. Um, so this is, we can probably uh, address this to either of you. Um, but we had a couple people asking if there's any alternatives to using water softener salts in their home, um, and also if there's any alternatives um, for ice melt materials. So I don't really know much about the water softeners. That's something I've really just been learning about this year is another one of the main sources, depending on where you are, of chloride in water. Um, but as far as alternative de-icers on the road, um, basically there's a downside to everything. Um, there's no sort of magic bullet and um, the road salt we use has kind of been found to be the most effective thing. That's why so much of what we advocate for and what the you know the states we work with that are kind of the furthest along what they do it's about using that salt effectively and precisely um you know things like sand that can cause sediment issues um i know there are additives like there are places that use beet juice but you know that's a bad idea in the chesapeake bay because that can um lead to uh, high nutrient levels in the Chesapeake. That's not, that's another water quality issue. So um, 
it's not the best. I mean, the best thing is to not drive for no one to drive anywhere when there's a snow event. Um, but short of that and short of some basically societal changes, um, what we can expect from the people who manage the roads is just better application of salt and smarter and more precise application. I don't know, if, Joel, if you have anything to offer about the water softener question. I don't really. There are probably ways you can approach it to use it more efficiently, similar to road salt. You know, use it as efficiently as possible so you only use yeah. what you need. Um, but that I, I will don't say, know. I will say, I saw some presentations this summer from folks in Minnesota where they talked about um, water softener and that it would be more efficient if it was the water was softened at the municipal level before it was sent to homes as opposed to doing it in individual homes. Um, that is really a systems change, but it's something that I saw being discussed. And to echo Emily on de-icing salt, I mean, like Maryland was state highway authority was mandated several years ago that they needed to think about how they were using salt and use it more efficiently. And you know, they've reduced their salt use by something like 30% while still offering the same level of service. So you can take a big first bite out of it just by, you know, thinking about and using best practices to apply just what you need. Yeah, and I will say state governments are kind of the furthest ahead, I think, because it's less people to coordinate. Um, but a place where a lot of change can be made is in parking lot application because folks who do parking lots, they don't necessarily know anything about what they're putting down or that it has any sort of harmful impact um, to water or infrastructure. Um, they're just kind of putting down as much as they can, which is why we have um, handouts for, I don't, think, I don't think we have it for salt applicators, but we have it for the business owners who would be requesting that salt application. So. We have some resources towards that, and that's something where we feel like we can make the most change at the localist level, most local level. <laughs> and that's one of the big holes in the data. One of the biggest unknowns is how much is put down because it's you know tens of thousands of businesses and applicators. And I, the estimate I saw for Toronto, so a dense urban area, something like 45% of the salt was put down by businesses or people putting it down on their behalf. So that sort of resource is fantastic and a great place to start. Why don't we do one more question, Zach, and then we can wrap it up. Okay. Um, well, this person was referring to your graphs uh, showing the high frequency data, Joel, and they're asking if that high frequency data collection needs open water. I think they're coming from Wisconsin and they said most of the streams and lakes there are frozen. Um, I think depending on the size of the stream, um, you can collect data even in the winter. So I mean the streams up in Massachusetts, um, you know, they collected data all winter. Partly the saltier the water is, the less likely it is to freeze um, and it's moving water. But I mean, I mean the Corsi at all, the one of the USGS studies I cited, they have a bunch of data from Wisconsin, although they weren't doing high frequency, but they they had collected some similar high frequency data. So it's often doable. Um, it is does require some more care and making sure your sensor doesn't freeze because it can damage, but it's definitely doable. It's a really good question. Oh, and being now in a warmer part of the country in Maryland, that's not something my students and I have had had to think about because the streams here don't typically freeze. All right, do you want to end that one? I think that's a good place to end. I know there were a bunch of other questions. Um, again, like Zach said, if you if we didn't address your question here, you can email us at the email you see on the screen, saltwatch at iwa.org. If there are any questions for Joel, I can pass them along to him. I think he's willing to answer some questions. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, again, if you want another kit, you can order it, saltwatch.org. Um, and if you want these presentations, also email us.
Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks so much.